Welcome to our public affairs event as sponsored by the Senior Lawyers Committee of the New York City Bar Association. My name is Gertrude Pfaffenbach and I'm co-chair of the Senior Lawyers Committee. Our presentation today is by Erica Payne and Morris Pearl speaking for the Patriotic Millionaires. The Patriotic Millionaires is a nonpartisan organization of Americans with high net worth who promote the restructuring of the American tax system so that the wealthy people pay a greater share of their income in taxes. Patriotic Millionaires was founded in 2010 by Erica Payne to advocate, advocate for the ex, expiration of the Bush tax cuts. Morris Pearl is the chair of the Patriotic Millionaires and the former managing director at BlackRock Inc. As the title of the talk indicates, this is about reform of the US tax code. A bit of historical and legal background may help to focus on the critical issue of taxation as we approach the defense of our democracy. That is government of, by, and for the people. That is our foundation. The first words of our constitution are, we the people, not artificial persons, and the people, not the ultra wealthy elite. There actually were no ultra wealthy elite at the time of the writing of the constitution anyway. So it is a concept that is more modern, much more modern than previously known. Taxation without representation was a rallying call for the revolution and one of the facts listed against the King of England in the Declaration of Independence. It is no less a call today. As our speakers will show, representation has been absconded from the real people who work and populate this country to the elite uber wealthy and entities designated as artificial persons. There are basically three types of taxes, income, property, and corporate, a derivative in, of income tax. The constitution was amended by amended, amendment number 16 to establish a federal income tax on, quote, taxes from incomes from whatever source derived, end quote. The constitution forbids title and nobility in the United States, and this is in section nine, getting out of the prop English property system of inherited wealth. What has now developed is dynastic wealth, which is basically the same thing without a title. What's worse is that the structure of estate taxes passes on tax-free wealth generation to generation. And although no titles, the wealth is transferred generationally among the elite. The corporate taxes used to, used to add to the general wealth of the country. Now, corporations shift income internationally to avoid taxes and have paid less and less US tax over the past 50 years. The general prosperity of the country can be tracked with the trend of corporate tax avoidance, legal or otherwise, with general wealth and prosperity consistently declining as the people have less and less say in the government. Over the past 50 years, our democracy has steadily been eroded by the interests of corporations and the wealthy elite who pay for political campaigns of candidates to do their bidding. The Supreme Court, which, by the way, is the least representative branch of our government, has handed down opinions that consistently eroded our democracy. It is quite appalling that the dissenting opinions are the ones that actually defend democracy. Time and time again, the court created machinations that put the rich and the corporations into more and more entrenched power. The tax code as it is today is a primary example of the methods used to destroy equity and the rights of ordinary people. This basic equity, inequity can be remedied. The founders had ideals and we still have the dream of achieving them. People still have goals and dreams. A future where quote, there will be no hunger, there will be no greed and all the children will know how to read is not unreasonable nor unreachable. That quote actually is by Gene Roddenberry the, on the philosophy of Star Trek, specifically the, the next generation. <laughs> Milton Friedman said that profit for shareholders is the only purpose of a corporation. Really? In this day and age? 
Friedman's bad idea has been perpetuated by the Supreme Court to the detriment of democracy and our well being over the past 50 years. If a corporation is designated as an artificial person, shouldn't the responsibilities of personhood also be the purpose of a corporation, which would include paying a fair share of their taxes? The modern view is that corporations, large and small, do have social responsibility. And there are several articles in the Harvard Business Review reviewing this topic. Most of the people of the United States believe that the wealthy do not pay their fair share of taxes. The remedy is to vote in representatives who actually represent the people and not to live in fear of the elite. As the high sparrow said of the elite, the rich in high places in the Game of Thrones, you are the few, we are the many. And when the many stop fearing the few, well, we can fill in the blank later. Erica Payne and Morris Pearl will explain in language all can understand the taxes, the loopholes, and how the codes discriminate. One of the goals of the New York City Bar Association is to promote equality. And what is a more fundamental way to start the process of promoting equality than to reform the tax code into fairness? Our format today will be in sections. The speakers will prevent a section, and then there will be a window for questions, which will be in the Q&A section of the Zoom screen for each section. Um, as you go through and if, as you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, icon, click on it, and you can write your question in that, that dialog box that comes up in the Zoom screen. So then we'll wrap up at the end. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we appreciate your participation. And I think we look forward to a very interesting and elucidating talk by Erica Payne and Morris Pearl. Thank you. And Morris will kick us off. Sure. Thank you. I'm Morris Pearl. I have the honor of serving as the chairman of the board of uh, the organization that Erica founded, the Patriotic Millionaires. We've been doing this for about, I've been doing this full time, actually, for about seven years now. And really, it's a lot more rewarding for me than for what I used to be doing when I was, you know, working in for financial companies and whatnot, just trying to give my children and now grandchild the opportunity to grow up in the same kind of opportunities that I did. So thank you for having us here. I'm very encouraged by uh, the introduction we got. And um, I truly believe that we can make some progress. So thank you, Erica. Um, good. Yeah, so hi, everybody. We're so excited to be here. Um, my name is Erica Payne. I'm the founder of the organization. And um, just a big thank you to Trudy and to the Bar Association for having us. We love talking to people about taxes. Some people think they are boring. We think they're one of the most exciting <laughs> topics um, on the planet. So we are thrilled to be able to share um, our passion and our viewpoint with you today. Um, a couple of things. I'm going to just start off and give us some context. And then and Morris and I will move into a more formal presentation about how the tax code itself is actually structured. So you can see within it what some of the challenges are. But let me just give you some context and a little bit of background about the Patriotic Millionaires Organization itself. Um, so without further ado, Sam, next slide. So this happened January 6th. Next slide. Why did this happen? We believe that this happened because inequality is the root cause of social unrest. Inequality in the United States today is higher than it has been in 100 years. And we are getting more unequal with each passing day. Here you see the Gini coefficient is a fabulous little number if you haven't heard of it. It's a number from zero to one. If everybody in a society has exactly the same amount of money, the Gini coefficient is zero. If one person in a town has all the money and everybody else has none, the Gini coefficient is one. You have seen our Gini coefficient, which is a measure of this inequality, just go up and up and up. Next slide. So what is the human cost of this inequality? You see here the US epidemic of 
despair. Currently in the United States, 2.5 million people are addicted to opioids. For the first time in American history, life expectancy is going down for segments of our population. And deaths of despair, deaths due to alcohol, suicide, and depression are at the highest level that they have ever been. So people are truly suffering. So next slide. Why is this relevant in a political context? Well, in a political context, you could see in 2016 and in 2020, Donald Trump performed best in those areas of the country with the highest levels of despair. So people are suffering and they look to inappropriate leaders and authoritarian leaders for safety. That's essentially what happens. Next slide. You can see here, this is just, um, we're basically gutting the middle class. The policies that we have had are diminishing the middle class, putting more money at the top, more money at the bottom. I'll age myself here for a second, next slide. For those of you all of a certain age, you'll remember the weeble wobbles. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. That's because they have a really nice center of gravity. And the middle class and a, a, a significant middle class helps bring stability to a society so that we can wobble, but we won't fall down. Instead of creating a weeble wobble country, next slide, we've created a, a country based on economic Jenga, where we keep on taking blocks, the wooden block game, you take on taking those blocks out of the middle, loading them on the top, it destabilizes the entire exercise. So we're going to look at both ends of that. We'll end with the tax section, but let's just look at the bottom end of our country. Next slide. So today in America, you hear a lot of conversation around the minimum wage. The minimum wage right now is $7.25 an hour. That translates into $15,000 a year for full-time work, which is nowhere on the planet sufficient to raise a family. No, not all that many people, a few million actually make the minimum wage. Most people make a little bit above that, but a low minimum wage affects the entire wage structure of the country. So we currently have about half the people in the United States are low wage workers. And these are folks who make around 12 bucks an hour in your basic small town in West Virginia and make up to about $18 an hour in a bigger city. If you can imagine trying to live in New York City on $18 an hour, you can see the challenges. The minimum wage has lost 20% of its purchasing power since um, it was last raised more than 10 years ago. We're actually coming up on the 12 year anniversary here in a few weeks. And it's lost about 40% of its purchasing power since its peak in 1968. So hardworking people, the floor is falling underneath them. So all the folks who make above that, they feel that pressure, that downward pressure on their wages. Next slide. This has been going on for a long time. Wages have been decoupled from productivity. So most of the productivity gains have been going to the top um, <clears throat> percentage of our population. If minimum wage since its peak in 1968 had kept up with inflation, it would currently be around $16 an hour. If it had kept up with inflation and productivity, it would be $22 an hour. Interesting side fact, you all probably know about when Henry Ford, I think it was in 1914, I can't remember, when he raised the wages of his factory workers saying he wanted them to have enough money to, um, to buy his cars. If you translate that dollar figure of the raise that he gave them into today's dollars, that would have been $16 an hour. Next slide. So why has this happened? On some level, um, it's because basically working people in the country have no power. If you have no power, um, you, can, you can guess pretty quickly that you're soon gonna have no money. Um, one of the basic um, building blocks of worker power is our unions, and you can see union membership has declined substantially since around 55 peak of 34 people, 34 percentage of people belong to a union. Today, we're at about 10%. Next slide. Simultaneously, incomes for the top 5% of earners and even more for the top 0.1% of earners have been going up substantially. Next slide. Just um, as, an, as a great example of this, the, um, the ratio of CEO to worker pay, you can see here in 1965, it was around 21 to 1. In 2020, it's around 300 to 1. Next slide. 
There are lots of examples where this is even worse in Walmart around 1200 to one, Disney about 1400 to one, and McDonald's about three thousand to one. Simultaneously, wealthiest people in the country have, um, have essentially stopped paying taxes, and this is a global trend. So you see corporate income tax and individual income tax rates for the wealthiest folks in, the, in this country and in the world during this um, period of time in the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years going down substantially. So next slide. Into this construct came the patriotic millionaires. Next slide. In 2010, during the lame duck session of Congress, it became quite clear that, Repub that, that President Obama was going to cave to Republican demands to extend the Bush tax cuts. And that just infuriated me. And so I called some millionaires I know, and about 50 of them signed a letter, short letter, you can see it here, um, that basically said, for the good of the country, raise our taxes. And I called them the patriotic millionaires, put the letter up on a website, and it exploded in the media. The next slide, the president of the Czech Republic addressed um, this group of millionaires on the floor of the Czech um, parliament, the largest television station in Japan flew over to do a little mini kind of mini documentary on it and but we didn't make everybody happy. Next slide. Orrin Hatch took to the floor of the United States Senate to say that basically if we wanted to pay more to the government, we were you know, more than welcome to. Um, next slide, we replied back that that was an absurd proposition given that there are 500,000 people in the country who make more than a million dollars a year. The 50 signers of this letter writing a check to the IRS was certainly not going to make a difference. We had a really great, really mean email sent to us at this time. Um, somebody telling us that we clearly knew absolutely nothing about tax policy and who in the world did you think, did we think we were? Well, next slide. A quick Google search revealed that he had spent six months in jail for tax evasion. Well, at first the White House didn't like us that much. They didn't like being told that they were doing the wrong thing and to have a bunch of millionaires publicly say that they were on the wrong track. Eventually, the White House saw that it was incredibly helpful to have a bunch of millionaires demanding higher taxes on themselves. And in 2012, we joined the president at the White House for his annual tax day address and several of our members stood behind him on stage. Next slide. Morris, as he said earlier, joined us shortly um, thereafter as the number one volunteer. And, um, and he has been an incredible force for us. He works with us full time and has for about seven years now. His leadership has been um, an, an incredible asset to the organization. Next slide. So we current our current mission, which is, is our modern mission, once we got through that first tax, we had the um, we we achieved that first goal, which was to eliminate the extension of the Bush tax cuts. The fight for 15 had launched at the same time. And then it became clear that all of this stuff was actually happening because the government has been so captured by moneyed interest. And so our mission is to reform the country's political economy so that it naturally delivers results that are conducive to a stable, prosperous nation. The, um, if you could, next slide. When I look at the political economy, and that's the intersection of the economy with the political choices that people make. Do you allow child labor? What's your hour, hourly rate of work? All of these different kinds of choices are made in the political arena and all of them affect the economy. So our political economy, that essential mechanism at the heart of our experience is delivering by definition results that are creating a society that is more unequal over time and very troubling, that inequality is growing more quickly over time. So how will we address that? Well, back, Sam. So we, so we want to do three things. Number one, we want to equalize political representation across all people so that wealthy people and CEOs and lobbyists for corporations do not have more power than the average person. We also would like to see this essential relationship between labor and capital reach some reasonable sustainable equilibrium. Of the policy proposals up now, we believe the $15 federal minimum wage and the elimination of the subminimum tipped wage is the best way to stabilize that floor, those 44% of our folks who work in low wage jobs. 
And the third piece is our tax system. How can we make sure that the responsibility goes to the people who have the greatest resources and that we unrig the rigging of the economy that happens through the tax code? Next slide. We're not all the way there. Our former president, Jimmy Carter, a few years back said the US is an oligarchy with unlimited political bribery. Um, this should be very troubling to everyone. Next slide. So what would progress look like? Democracy reform, we saw that fail yesterday in the Senate, but, um, but, but it is dead for now, but not dead forever. We have to do some substantial reforms to our democracy. We must raise our minimum wage and we must reform our tax system. Next slide. Given that a Princeton study showed that the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule near zero statistically non-significant impact on public policy, we thought it was best to get some influencers in the mix. Next slide. So in the words of our fabulous chairman, if, <laughs> if politicians will only listen to people with power and money, then people with power and money have to work together to advance the common good. So with that as a little bit of context and a little bit about our organization and its, um, and its founding 10 years ago, let's turn now into a deep dive into our tax code. All right, so Morris, 70% of Americans think the economy is rigged against them. Guess what, folks? They are right. It is rigged against them. So Morris, how do you rig an economy? That's easy, Erica. You start with the tax code. During World War II, the top marginal income tax rate was 94%. During the Eisenhower years, it was 91%. Today, 37%. Who's in charge of Washington has changed countless times over these last 70 years. The tax rate for the richest people in our country has gone in one direction, down. So y'all, most tax legislation ultimately gets bipartisan support. So it's really hard to know whom to blame. That changed in 2016 when the Republican Party took over the entire federal government. They had so much power that they didn't have to be bipartisan. And in 2017, they used that power to rewrite the entire federal tax code. And to be clear, some of the nonsense in the tax code has been around for years, but in 2017, Republicans have decided to take full responsibility for it. They're the only ones who voted for it. They have to own it. In 2018, the year after the Republicans rewrote the entire federal tax code, for the first time in history, billionaires paid a lower effective tax rate than every other group of taxpayers in the country. So let's see how that happens by comparing a regular person's taxes to a rich person's taxes. So say that two people, call them Joe and Cammie Workhard, both worked full time last year, putting in 40 hours every week. Together, they made $100,000, just above average for a two earner household. They're married and they'll file their taxes jointly. So after taking the standard deduction and paying into Social Security and Medicare, they end up with $75,200 in taxable income. All right, so let's step back here and explain a couple of things. Here's a chart of the federal tax bracket showing how much you pay at each level of income. This is for married people filing jointly. Everybody gets a standard deduction. Now, this is the amount the government thinks you need to take care of yourself. And you only pay taxes on the federal level if you make above that amount. We have a progressive federal income tax system, meaning that you pay a slightly higher percentage of your income in taxes the more money you make. So after the standard deduction, a married couple filing jointly will pay 10% on the first chunk of their taxable income, 12% on the next bit after that, and so on and so forth until they max out at a rate of 37% for any income over around $620,000. Now, everybody pays the same rate as they move through those tax brackets, and everyone maxes out at 37%, whether they make $622,000 or $622 million. So back to the work cards. With $75,200 of income after the standard deduction, the work cards will pay 10% of the first chunk and 12% of the rest for a total federal tax bill of around $8,600. All right, now let's say two other people. We'll call them Ronald and Melanie Slump. They sit around all year long tanning at the beach. One day, Ronald clicks a button on the couple's E-Trade account and sells some stock, making a cool profit of $100,000. The slumps would take the standard deduction and be left with $75,200 of taxable income, 
just like the work cards. They made the same amount of money. So the slump should pay around the same amount in taxes as the work cards, right, Morris? Wrong. Under our current tax system, the slumps will pay zero in taxes on that income. The work cards worked hard all year trying to get ahead, while the slumps, who are already rich, sat on the beach drinking strawberry daiquiris. At the end of the year, the work cards are almost $9,000 poorer than the slumps. So how does this happen? I'll tell you how. Republican lawmakers who wrote the new federal tax code believe money should be taxed differently depending on how you make it. Here's a comparison with the rate side by side. Like the work carts, most people make ordinary income. You work, you make money from that work, you get a paycheck and taxes come out of that paycheck. Other people, and this is mostly millionaires, make capital gains income. You buy an asset like a stock, it goes up, you sell it for a profit, the profit is considered a capital gain. Capital gains income is taxed at a much lower rate than ordinary income. So if you work for a living, you actually pay a higher tax rate on your income than people who live off their investments. But that's not the best deal in the new Republican tax code. The best deal is to inherit money like Donald Trump did. Let's say the work hard's got new jobs singing full time for America Sings. They're such good singers. Last year, America Sings paid them $11 million. They pay Social Security and Medicare, took the standard deduction. They ended up with just under $11 million of taxable income. They pay 10% of the first chunk, 12% of the next chunk, and so on, maxing out at 37% and all the income above around $622,000. The work card's total tax bill for the year, around $4 million. Now, making $11 million a year is hardly reasoning Primary River. But how does the work card's tax bill compare with the slump's tax bill? Well, the slumps also had a really good year. Mr. Slump's great aunt died and left her entire $11 million estate to the slumps. Don't worry, they were not close. So how much will the slumps pay in taxes on their $11 million of inheritance income, Morris? Nothing, zero, nada. When Republican lawmakers rewrote the federal tax code, they exempted the first $11 million of every estate from taxes, over $22 million for a couple. Once again, the work cards and the slumps took in the same amount of pre-tax income, but because they earned their money in different ways, one couple by working, another couple by waiting for someone to die, the slumps ended the year $4 million richer than the work cards. All right, so we've hit on income. Now let's turn to wealth. Wealth is the total value of all of the assets a person owns. And half of Americans have no wealth at all. But for the ones that do, they may have some money in a retirement account or a stock market account, but the majority of their wealth is their primary residences, their homes. That is not true of most rich people. So while um, most rich people may own several houses, most of them keep their money in all kinds of other assets. These are things like stock, art, jewelry, yachts, and 15 feet preserved sharks. Yes, that's a thing. And yes, a billionaire paid $8 million for it. So how are different kinds of wealth treated in the tax code? Back to the work cards and the slumps. The work cards wealth is basically their home. A lovely little house in Dayton, Ohio with an assessed value of $250,000. Homeowners pay around 1.68% in property tax in Dayton. So for the work cards, the tax on their wealth, their home is around $4,000 per year. They will pay that property tax every single year. The slumps also keep part of their wealth as a lovely little house in Dayton, Ohio, with an assessed value of $250,000. They use it to store their furs in the summer. Like the work cards, they too will pay property tax on that part of their wealth for a total of $4,000 per year. Now, the slumps used to own a lot more houses, but Mrs. Slump really does not like paying taxes. So several years ago, they sold all of their houses except for the one in Dayton. Ms. Slump was worried her furs would be traumatized by the move. They made $500 million on the sale of all of those other houses. And with that $500 million, the Slumps bought a small yacht, a large plane, three Picasso paintings, one from his blue period, a pink diamond, two prize racehorses, and one decorative flower pot filled with antique gold coins. Morris, what was the total tax bill on that part of their wealth? Zero, not a nothing. The work cards have wealth of $250,000. 
The slums have wealth of $500 million, $250,000. The annual tax on their respective wealths is exactly the same. Now, you may have thought we broke from England and started our own country over here because we wanted things to be different. But take a deep dive into our tax code and you'll hear God Save the Queen playing in the background. That's right, Erica. The Republican lawmakers who rewrote the new federal tax code clearly prefer a permanent aristocracy. You want proof? Remember how capital gains taxes worked? You buy stock for $1 million, you sell it for $10 million. You only pay tax on the $9 million you gained. And you only pay those taxes if and when you sell the stock. Simple enough. But what if you bought that stock for $1 million, it grew to be worth $10 million, but you never sold it, and then you died? At your death, the stock goes to your heirs. In the new Republican tax code, when your heirs inherit that stock, poof, the cost basis magically changes. Instead of the basis being $1 million, where you paid for the stock when you bought it, the cost basis stepped up to $10 million the value it had on the day that you died. When your heirs sell that stock, they only pay tax on the gains above the new $10 million basis. Nine million of capital gains, totally wiped out for federal tax purposes. So another gimmick called the 1031 exchange allows investors to avoid capital gains taxes when they sell a piece of property if they immediately invest that money into another property. Let's say a developer buys a building worth $10 million holds it for a few years and then sells it for $60 million. And with that 60 million, he buys 1,000 buildings worth together $60 million. The developer is $50 million richer, but he has still paid no taxes. If he dies, his estate will pay some estate taxes, but his heirs will inherit all of that $60 million property at the new basis. That's how millionaire real estate families acquire billions of dollars worth of property without ever paying taxes. Let's think about that for a minute. On one side is a wealthy heir who never worked, who inherited millions of dollars and contributed nothing to the country. On the other side are people like the work carts who go to work, pay their taxes, and do their part for the country every day. Now, between a third and a half of all the wealth in America is inherited, and there's nothing wrong with inheriting money, of course, but there's no reason at all that inheritance income should be taxed differently than other kinds of income. So we've talked about people. Let's turn now to corporations. <clears throat> In 2020, if you bought a single pair of Nike socks, you paid more for those socks than Nike paid in federal income taxes for the entire year. If you sent a single package through FedEx last year, <clears throat> you paid more for your delivery than FedEx paid in taxes for all of 2020. Morris, how does this happen? Well, there are actually a lot of ways this can happen. But one of the main ones is the new federal tax code allows companies to pretend they do business somewhere other than where they actually do business. Let's say a company like Starbucks, for example. Starbucks has several thousand stores in the United States and a few dozen in Ireland. You'd expect them to pay a lot of tax in the United States and much less tax in Ireland. That would make sense. That is not the way it actually works. Large companies have what's called intellectual property, a trademark or a patent, for example. Unlike land and buildings, intellectual property can be transferred to another country as fast as you can click send on an email. Picture that Starbucks logo. A smart lawyer can transfer ownership of that logo to Starbucks of Ireland, who would then legally own the logo. In order to use the logo, Starbucks of the United States would have to send more royalty payments to Starbucks of Ireland the company can make the royalty payments almost whatever they want. If they make the payments big enough, the company will all of its profits in Ireland, where tax rates are much lower, even though they sold hugely more coffee in the United States. Using this and other tricks, 55 of the largest US companies paid zero federal income tax in 2020, zero. So here we are again, with the work cards holding up their end of the bargain and everybody else shirking their responsibility. No, rich people and CEOs love pretending that there are really, really good reasons why they should pay lower taxes than all of the rest of us. Their favorite reason is that they are job creators. Ooh, like they're little magicians who create jobs out of thin air just by waving a little wand. In 2017, there were a lot of CEOs who insisted they would hire more people if Republicans cut the corporate tax rate. They even launched a big job creators bus tour that went all over the country. The CEO of AT&T, Randall Stevenson, one of the biggest cheerleaders for the corporate tax cut, 
He insisted the correlation between tax cuts and job creation was very, very tight. Now, keep in mind, corporations only pay taxes on their profits. Profits are calculated after deducting expenses like payroll. So Mr. Stevenson's claim doesn't even make sense on its face. But be that as it may, maybe he was just confused. Maybe he thought he would hire people if the corporate tax rate was lower. Morris, I just don't think so. You see, from 2008 to 2015, AT&T paid an effective corporate tax rate of 8%. That was well below the statutory rate at the time of 35%. According to Mr. Stevenson, during that period of time, they should have hired tons of people, but they didn't. During that period of time, the company actually cut 80,000 jobs. And since the new Republican tax code went into effect, AT&T has cut an additional 40,000 jobs. In his last year as CEO, AT&T paid Stevenson $32 million. Now, investors like me pay half the tax rate of people who actually work for a living. Lawmakers justify that lower rate by saying investors are job creators and insisting if we raise their taxes, they won't invest. But that just is not true. But let me explain. Apple, for example, employs thousands of people to make iPhones and computers. I am an investor in Apple. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Apple stock. But none of the money I spent buying that Apple stock even went to Apple. It went to other investors who just happened to be selling their stock that day. People who work at Apple have jobs because of the millions of customers who want to buy iPhones, not because of investors like me. Consumer demand is the only real job creator. And to be clear, to be clear, investors are not going anywhere regardless of the tax rate. The alternative to investing is, is sticking your money in a mattress. Last I checked, mattresses do not provide a very high return. Regular working people pay twice the tax rate that Morris pays. So even if you have the same income that he does, you end up every single year worse off. All right, so we've described where we are. Now let us describe where we want to go. Let me tell you about our North Star of taxes. Next slide. Here are the basics of what we want to see. Number one, on the corporate side, corporations have to stop pretending that they're doing business somewhere other than where they're doing business. And the US government needs to make sure that they are paying taxes where they are actually doing business and that they're not rewarded for shipping all of our jobs overseas. Number two, we have to actually enforce the tax laws that we have on the books. The last figure I saw showed that we're losing about $700 billion a year by not enforcing our existing tax code. On the personal side, we want to do several things. First, we'd like to see a wealth tax on incomes over $100 million. We'd like to see a global wealth registry so people can't hide their money in other countries. We'd like to see a wealth transfer tax um, over a million dollars. Essentially, we should treat all money over a million dollars equally, whether you make it from working, from investing, or from inheriting. We'd like to eliminate the stepped up basis, modify the trust, which have become this absolute nonsense crazy thing. And we'd like to end the bracket racket. Next slide. Right now, our top income tax bracket is around 37%. We would like to see substantially higher rates back to where we were after World War II with the top rate of 90% for incomes over $100 million. So that's the basics of our plan. If you'd like to know more, next slide, you can buy our book, Tax the Rich, How Wise Loopholes and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer. And just to conclude, I'd say next slide, y'all have um, the title of this presentation was Tax the Rich Question Mark, the title of your session. And we would just like to say that we don't think that this is a question at all anymore. It is an emphatic necessity. So yes, let's tax the rich. If you want to learn more, join the fight to unrig the economy, tax the rich, and save this great country of ours, please visit Tax the Rich. Com. Thank you. And you don't even need to buy a book. If you actually want one, we'll be glad to send you one. Yeah, if y'all just put your put your snail mail address in the um in the chatter here, I'll put on um I'm gonna put Sam's email address in here. And any we would love to send free books to all of y'all. So just um just send your snail mail address to Sam and we'll get a book out to you. Well, Erica and and Morris, thank you so much. That was uh, a very nice down to earth 
explanation of the basis of why our tax system is not working. Um, I'm, I'm checking for questions and although I don't have any, maybe you have some on yours. Uh, but I think that one of the issues that I read over my um, span of time preparing for this is, is why, why do the ultra wealthy feel entitled to never pay their share? Um, I think that Abigail Disney had a comment on it that having wealth was an addiction. Um, what, what could you say about that? I'm not in that elite area, I, so uh, I can't imagine. I, I agree with you. Um, I think sometimes it is an addiction. I think also, though, we should recognize that a lot of people don't actually believe the system is fair either, but they're still taking advantage of the unfairness of it. I think if you ask most people, most people agree with our points that we're making, but they just are fairly satisfied just kind of letting the system go on and being wealthy and taking advantage of it. So it's not so much being entitled, it's more feeling feeling like they don't want to do anything to rock the apple cart, to, to upset the system. They just want to continue on the way it is. Yeah. Actually, there's some questions that are coming up. Um, and one is, can you speak a little bit about the scenario of selling real estate and investing in art or other valuables? And why does, the, or the gain on real estate melts away if it is invested in other things? Um, how does that work? Well, I'm, I'm um, unlike most people in this call, I'm actually not a lawyer. Um, so I may not be the best one to answer a technical question. Um, but what we were, what Erica and I were talking about in the presentation was the um, a section 1031 like kind exchange. So it actually applies to selling something and then buying some other like kind things. So typically it's one piece of real estate for another piece of real estate. It's considered like kind. The idea is that you can, if you buy something and if you sell something and buy something that's similar to the thing that you sold, you, you can carry over the basis and you don't have to have any a real, have a realized gain at that point in time. Okay. Um, actually, I, I'm just realizing that a lot of questions have come into the chat instead of the Q&A. So let me, let me see what I can uh, get to this. Uh, what, what, if any thoughts, do you have on Dorothy Brown's scholarship concerning the racialized structure of the tax code and her recent book, The Whiteness of Wealth? I haven't read the book yet. I've heard great things about it. So, I mean, I would say that the vast majority of people in the country who have money are white men. And so I'm, I'm interested to see how, how she dove into that topic. I haven't read it, so I don't particularly have thoughts on her book. Yeah, I, I also admire her greatly. One of the things that we've written about is that um, back when I was young, my parents and many people, including my parents, took advantage of government subsidized mortgages and had much lower mortgage rates than other people um, because they had these mortgages from Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, were only available in stable neighborhoods. And the definition of stable was racially segregated. So essentially, people my age who happen to be white are far wealthier than people my age who happen to be black because my parents had far lower mortgage payments and in fact, many black people weren't able to get mortgages at all and had to live in rentals, which are much more expensive for all of that time. So yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert in everything, but I happen to know a lot about mortgages because I spent most of my career. And um, yes, this is the short answer. I mean, there was, uh, I recall, um, and it gives away my age a little bit too, but uh, that there was um, actual redlining. Uh, for districts to either get the mortgage or not get the mortgage. And that alone has uh, caused tremendous problems. I mean, it's just been generational. Uh, 
leading to the inequity we have now. Yeah, that's why blockbusting was a real thing. If you lived in a white neighborhood and one black person, one black family moved in, that really did damage greatly the property values of your house and your neighbors. Um, and it was a real thing. Um, so I'll just, I'll pick up on this question from Diane. Um, her question is, what do you estimate will be the biggest hurdle to overcome in order to successfully reform the tax code? So um, here's the political dynamic right now. The U.S. Senate is split 50-50. Um, you typically, for most legislation, you need 60 votes to pass. On budget issues through budget reconciliation, you only need 51 votes to pass. So the 50 um, Democrats in the Senate plus one vote from Kamala Harris will allow for tax reform to happen if they can keep the Democratic caucus united around the idea of tax reform. And that will be an incredibly difficult exercise. We currently have somewhere between 12 and 15 senators on the Democratic side who, um, who will be very problematic in deciding to, for example, equalize ordinary income and capital gains. They will not want to eliminate the stepped up basis. They will not want to um, close the, you know, de deal with the 1031 exchange for a variety of reasons. Um, we, we, we would like to assume that they are doing that because they are misinformed and not because they are, they are expressing undue influence from outside forces. Um, but I think you cannot escape from the fact that basically quite a bit of our government, including quite a bit of the Democratic Party, has been captured by elite interest. And so but the, I mean, the interesting thing about what's happening right now is that we do only need 51 votes to bring about substantial reform. And for the first time in several decades, we have a White House who is actually committed to really substantial reform. So if we can keep the 50 Democrats together and get them to make some big moves, equalize ordinary income and capital gains, eliminate the stepped up basis, some of these core pieces, we would do a reasonably good job of, um, of taking a first step to correcting what I believe is really an existential crisis for the country. I mean, as I said earlier, the political economy guarantees that we are gonna become even more unequal, even more quickly over time. And given that we're more unequal than we have been in 100 years, and given the level of social unrest that we currently structure, I don't think that we can wait. We have to unrig this economy as quickly as is humanly possible. And if we can keep the Democratic caucus committed to doing that, then we will be able to achieve a chunk of that in this next Congress. But we basically have three months to do it because they're debating it right now. Oh, I'm Trudy, you're, um, you're on mute. Yeah, I didn't realize. Um, yeah, I, there's another question uh, with a follow-up uh, to the question you just answered. And do you think, what is an accurate estimate of our chances at successful reform percentage-wise? So um, I never do predictive politics. Okay. I think built into predictive politics is an assumption that the actions that you take between now and whatever happens or didn't happen that you predicted have no impact. I mean, I will tell you if all 66 of the people on this call called Chuck Schumer tomorrow and said, we are Democrat, you know, we are, we are New York people and we are committed to our democracy and committed to unrigging our economy. You need to make sure that happens. I'm happy to put the number to the US Senate. Maybe Sam can put the number to the US Senate in the chat. You all, particularly being in New York, have an enormous amount of power because the majority leader is your Senator and Senator Schumer will decide to a certain extent how this tax um, debate unfolds and, and what he is doing vis-a-vis -vis, um, the members of his caucus. 66 calls into his office today um, and perhaps more call him once a week for the next foreseeable future. You all can make an enormous impact on this debate. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to give an estimate because we have an ability to make that estimate 100% certainty that good reform will happen if people on this call and other people like you lean in right now. Okay, I'm just going through and there are more questions. Uh, what has been 
the historical impact of higher rates on the mobility of the domicile and place of business of high income individuals to lower rate jurisdictions? I think very little internationally. You know, people know that there's lower tax rates in Somalia, but there's more people who want to move from Somalia to New York than from New York to Somalia. Yes, there have been well publicized cases of people moving from California to Texas or New York to Florida, although there have been people moving from New York to Florida for generations. Um, I think people who live in New York live in New York because they want to live in New York. Um, those people who decide where to live based solely on tax rates, they probably don't live in New York now. I, assume, I believe their grandparents moved away when Herbert Lehman raised their taxes extensively in the 1930s. So I'm really not worried about that. I think it's kind of a canard of an argument. Oh, we have to appease the rich or they'll take their ball and run away someplace. So no, I don't really buy that argument. Okay. Um, boy, there's a lot of questions coming in here. Good. So, yeah, I know. I just have to see if they're, they're duplicative so that I can generalize. Um, one, one is, uh, have you allied with racial justice organizations and other organizations promoting the same goal? Um, how many groups, and, and I'll, I'll add to that, how many groups uh, can combine? It would be really effective, I think, if um, the whole idea was espoused by many, I think, and it is, but what do you think um, of alliances with patriotic millionaires? So we have, we have a number of partners that we work with across all three of our issue areas, equal political representation, a livable minimum wage, and a fair tax system. Um, we partner with, um, I mean, li kind of every group you can possibly imagine. I will tell you in the tax space, it's a little bit more difficult. Minimum wage is a policy that is you know, relatively easy to understand. Um, I think equal political representation is another one that has a lot of, of groups united around that. In the area of tax, we do have more of a problem because the education on this issue is so low. It's one of the reasons we wrote the book and one of the reasons that we're doing the roadshow. Tax policy, people believe tax policy, tax policy to an extent is quite complicated, but ultimately what is actually happening in tax policy is not particularly complicated, which is rich people are getting away with murder and the middle class is holding the bag. And, um, and so, but what we have tried to do over the course of the last two, particularly in the last two years, we launched a tax the rich campaign two years ago is to educate as many folks in influential positions as possible. So we work in a coalition with a lot of, um, of groups um, towards tax policy, but we really need a bigger boat. And frankly, I mean, the reality, as I said earlier in the presentation, is that the lawmakers tend to listen to people with power and money. So the more people that we can get with power and money to actually directly advocate for a reasonable tax system, that would be incredibly healthy, help, helpful. Unfortunately, if you go through, you know, the list of the top thousand donors to the Democratic Party, um, I would say the overwhelming majority, 99% of those have never spoken to a lawmaker telling him to raise their taxes, have never hired a lobbyist to advocate for fair taxes. They don't fund groups that work on fair taxes. And so this is a really difficult area, both because the money people don't want it to happen and because the organizations that are grassroots oriented um, don't know that much about tax policy. So we're trying to, and so, and so it's hard for them to feel comfortable being effective advocates. So we are in a position now where we're trying to educate the public. It's also, I will say, it is over the popular support for taxing millionaires and corporations is overwhelming, including the vast majority of Republicans. So the only people who disagree with this unremarkable idea are the runs running the government. But if we can get 50 of them to stick together and vote for this, we can get stuff done this year. I think I did want to address Trudy. I saw somebody in here. Um, the presentation is a little misleading. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm other than real estate, so I'm not sure what's misleading about it. What, what we the like kind exchange, the 1031 is around real estate. What we were trying to the point we were trying to make in the wealth tax part is that if your real estate, if your wealth is in your home, you pay taxes on it. If your wealth is in multiple other things, you don't particularly pay taxes on it. 
Okay. Um, let's see. There's something else here. Uh, given the clear reasons for the tax inequity, how to convince those opposed to reform? I think you partially answered that in your last answer about uh, addressing your three issues. Yeah, the uh -huh. people opposed to reforms are either the polit or, or either the Republican Party, which I think at this point has become a wholly owned subsidiary of the billionaire class. They're not going to do anything, so why bother? On the Democratic side, you have a lot more room for movement. Um, the best way to convince the 12 to 14 Democrats who are not going to be super excited about tax reform is to have people who are either their constituents who have a business in their area. Um, or who have contributed money to them to call them consistently for the next three months and demand that they reform the tax code. Okay, there's, there's a couple of questions, one in the chat and one in the uh, uh, Q&A on, um, one is uh, the main barrier to the financing of political campaigns and please comment on campaign finance reform vis-a-vis -vis tax reform. Um, can you comment on that? Those? Yeah, I mean, we're a, we're awash in money. I will tell you that there are reforms that can bring about a change in that dynamic. Morris could maybe speak to the um, public financing of campaigns that happened in New York and the transformation you saw, Morris. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, we have a public campaign finance system in New York that's similar to what's proposed to the rest of the country in HR1 and S1. And it's really changed the face of City Hall, it changed the face in City Hall. Um, and it's really made a huge difference in people's lives. And I think the premise of the question is correct, that it's because lawmakers spend so much of their time talking to rich people, because they spend so much of their time doing fundraising and you raise funds from rich people, they know very well what the rich people think about everything and how frustrating it is to have to pay any of your money in taxes for some people. And they don't spend that much time talking to everyone else. So even if they happen to be very well-meaning, they just are hear the rich people's point of view so much more than the point of view of the people who work for a living that is overwhelming. So I think the, I fully agree with the premise of the several questions that campaign finance reform is a important step towards accomplishing this goal or most other goals for that matter. Um, <clears throat> there's a, another question on the loopholes. Uh, I don't think you, talked about the loser, of, no matter what we do, we, regardless, regarding percentage of tax rate, it won't I, matter if the loopholes stay in place. Uh, I think you, Susan, yeah. this is a, this is a, this is a, com, we completely agree with you. I think that you will hear over the coming weeks, a lot of debate, for example, about what the corporate percentage should be. So the corporate, um, the corporate tax rate, the statutory rate used to be 35%. We showed you that even during that time when it was 35%, companies like AT&T were paying 8%. The rate um, right now is reduced to, by um, the Republicans in the rewrite of the tax code to 21%. Biden is now saying he wants it to be 28%. Joe Manchin is saying he'll only go above 25%. And, um, and Susan, I completely agree with you. I think the discussion around the percentages, um, particularly in the corporate front, don't really have to do with solving the problem. They need to address this issue of businesses pretending to do business somewhere other than where they're doing business. And then on the personal side, um, again, those percentages, most of our income tax system is oriented around income, which hides a huge amount of wealth of the wealthiest people in the country because they often don't have much income. Um, they also can borrow against their wealth. And so they can end up showing that they have no income. Those are all things that need to be addressed. The loop, the, the countless Swiss cheese of loopholes is actually most of the problem. Susan, we agree with you. There's other things too in our book that you can read about. Um, yeah, there's, there's still some more questions coming in. Uh, one, um, let's see, also regard to political campaigns, and this is more on the corporate side. What action can the legislature take to uh, reverse the impact of Citizens United? Um, which gave the well, person I mean, of a corporation the right to donate unlimited to campaigns. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, the reform bill that passed in the House, it was HR1 in the House and it's S1 in the Senate. And you all would have seen the news reports yesterday that S1 yeah. failed. Um, the, the, the bill itself didn't fail. Republicans refused to even debate it. And they implemented, um, you know, they, they played out the filibuster card to keep themselves from even having to address it. That legislation would have done a tremendous amount to mitigate the impact of the Citizens United decision. Um, I used to, in graduate school, play a lot of chess. And, um, and in chess, if somebody attacks a piece of yours, you can either move it, depend it, or attack a piece of theirs of, um, of greater material value. And that's kind of the best way to think about balancing the power dynamics within the United States. If you can do public financing, if you can end gerrymandering, if you can ensure an, a very easy, viable road to vote for all Americans, you will by definition mitigate the amount of, um, of influence that the money has because you are putting equal power on, or maybe not equal, but you're putting enough power on the other side to mitigate the money. So the best way that the lawmakers can address the Citizens United problem is to put more power in the hands of average Americans by making it easier for them to vote, by eliminating gerrymandering, by implementing public financing, and all of those things would make tremendous differences and they can all be done at the legislative level. Um, yeah, I, I think as well that really the, the vote and getting true representatives into our houses of Congress is, is the way that we have to go um, to solve this and other problems. Um, another, another question came up or has been there. Does your organization advocate for reducing taxes on the middle class and people under middle class? Um, you know what, we don't focus a lot of attention on that. I will tell you one of the pieces that I really liked about the Republican rewrite of the federal tax code is that they upped the standard deduction quite substantially. Um, and so that was, that was actually a really nice piece. I think they did that in order to be able to, from a marketing perspective, say that they had given tax breaks to middle-class families. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't personally believe that that was their intent, given how they actually ended up writing the, the bill. But um, there are things like the EITC and the child care tax credit that we sort of indicate to lawmakers that we're in conversation with that we are supportive of, but we are really focused on reforming the top end of the tax code and dealing with people in, I mean, really like the 0.1% and above. I will say interesting side and terrible fact is that um, the most people getting audited right now um, are people who are taking advantage of the EITC. So people who definitionally are struggling, um, that's where the IRS is focusing their auditing attention, which I think is absurd. Yeah. Um, well, I think that that goes into the problem of the funding of the IRS and its enforcement capacities. Uh, who is being audited? Uh, not people who are not paying their taxes, uh, people who are trying to pay their taxes and don't have lawyers or accountants doing it, and they make mistakes, um, I believe. Um, I may be wrong. But the, the people who have probably thousand page tax returns, whatever, I don't know. Um, I don't do my taxes, my husband does. And uh, it's ours is really simple. But if you have a lot of pages to go through, you can all do, if it's like, for instance, the patent office where there is a quota for how many cases you do per time period. Uh, if you have a one 1,000 page tax and you have 10 that are maybe 25 pages, how are you gonna use your time if you're a, a, a reviewer or an auditor? Uh, like the patent office, if you're an examiner, how, how many, can I do? I have to do this many in this amount of time. And so I'm going to spend time on something uh, that I can, can quickly go through before I tackle the hard ones. And then maybe you don't get to the hard ones. I don't know. What is your there's opinion one, on that? There's one question in here that I think is really interesting that we should address um, from an anonymous Mindy who says, um, what do you say to taxing wealth being impractical? How do you value a pet shark from your to oh, year. Yeah. 
um, I missed that one. So I, 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 I'll just say, yeah. I, guess, I guess it depends on if the pet shark is biting or not that year. So leave <laughs> the pet shark away. Um, look, y'all, we have a we have a rover on Mars. We can figure out how much a bunch of rich people are worth. I mean, th this is simply, yes, is it difficult to value privately held assets? Of course, is it difficult to value um, private companies? Of course. But I would say that let's not even worry about getting it 100% right first. You know, we have a system where the work carts are paying tax on their wealth because their wealth is in their house. And that same system has people who have enormously orders of magnitude, more wealth than the work carts, paying no taxes. We need to correct this imbalance, period. And I refuse to believe that a society who has built supercomputers, put a rover on Mars and sent people to the moon cannot figure out with a reasonable estimation how much somebody like George Soros or Warren Buffett is worth. I just don't agree with that. And we're talking about not everyone. We're talking about a few thousand people in the entire country who have wealth of that kind of magnitude. And um, Senator Wyden has put forth some bills with provisions for figuring out later if something turned out to be wrong and privately held businesses and eventually being realization events and and doing adjustments with you know uh, retro retro retroactively. So it it can be done. Yes, it's hard, but a lot of things are hard. Um, but that's not a reason not to do them. We already do valuations of all these things for estate tax purposes. And that's not easy, but is done. So it clearly, if it can be done a bit certain times when someone dies, it can be done more often. So it, yes, we agree it's hard, but that doesn't mean not to do it. Trudy, we have a question in here also that I think is kind of fun if, if I could. It says um, for a moment, if you could present the opposing side, what do you think is the most convincing, convincing pitch that opponents make and how do you respond to it? Um, the primary pitch that we see from the opposing side is this job creators myth. Mm -hmm. They are really, really committed to it. And just go through basically any article about the folks who are opposing changes to, like 181 CEOs signed a letter opposing Biden's um, higher corporate tax rate. There's a business association that started maybe a week or so ago about all of these business associations are now gathering together into this coalition. Um, the primary argument they put forth is don't tax the job creators. And we, we and facts should allow people to understand that the corporate tax rate is where it said it has literally nothing to do with job creation. Job creation, the single only job creator, aside from the government hiring somebody, but the jo job creator is consumer demand, full stop. If you run a bar, are you more concerned about how much you're paying that bartender or are you more concerned with how much money all of the people who could potentially come in for a Friday afternoon beer have? Your bar will be successful only if a number of people have enough money to go into your bar. Your corporate tax rate does not have anything to do with that. And so, and the issue is that a lot of corporate CEOs are just simply, Morris is nicer than I am. Morris doesn't necessarily think they're lying. He thinks that they are misinformed. I, or, or I don't know if he thinks, I don't know. I, he just doesn't like to be critical of them. I don't mind being critical of people like Randall Stevenson, who laid off 80,000 people when his effective corporate tax rate was 8%, was one of the biggest cheerleaders for corporate tax reform. He was everywhere in the newspaper and in the media insisting that these tax cuts were gonna be a good thing. And as soon as the tax cut went into place, AT&T laid off 40,000 people. I mean, the CEOs of America are lying to the American people about what actually creates jobs. And it's really appalling. It's appalling to be a witness to. And if we could take one ridiculous trope out of our public debate, it would be that wealthy people and CEOs are job creators. It is simply patently false. Just think of an income statement and you have gross sales, you have expenses, you have operating income, then you have taxes, and then you have net income. So if, if somebody 
if, if there's no profits, then there's no taxes. And so it doesn't matter what the tax rate is. And if there are profits, then there are profits at any tax rate. And if hiring another person will increase the profits, hiring that person will increase the profits regardless of what the tax rate is at any rate between zero and 100%. That same decision will result in higher profits. So it, it, it just doesn't even make any mathematical sense what, what they say. I mean, yeah. So yes, that's our argument. Yeah, um, I, I think that the lack of recognition of actual facts, uh, <laughs> data that is available rather easily uh, on employment, uh, profits and uh, what what a particular company is is doing uh, with its personnel. Uh, it, it's not that hard to find uh, why the CEO of a company does not know what his or her, mostly his, still white men, uh, company has as employees, as profits, and as uh, credits and debits. I, I've seen enough in, in litigating that it's, it, it is amazing um, who we call the leaders of industry uh, because I don't know where they get their information. Um, I, I think they're not given the information or they're ignoring the facts or whatever it is. So, I mean, there's a major information problem there. And yes, they are lying to the American public in more ways than job creation. I mean, just imagine if you had to go through a 10K form in front of a jury. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> I've read many 10Ks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it is just uh, appalling. So, yes, um, getting the truth out isn't that that impossible, but when the stage is given to someone who either doesn't look at it, doesn't want to admit it, doesn't want to declare anything, uh, you know, create that they are not creating jobs. Uh, it, it's just uh, another big lie, uh, perpetuating the disastrous effect on our economy and our. I democracy. think some of it is this sort of patriarchal mindset that oh, we have to defer to the you know, the father figure or the CEO or the president or you know whomever whomever it is, and I think. That's just kind of their mindset is, oh, the, the, the boss is in charge and whatever he says goes. And, you know, everything that every good thing that happens, well, that's attributed to the boss or the father, or whomever, you know, the head of the organization is. And that's just kind of the conservative mindset is, is that's built in, I think. I don't know. I really don't. Yeah, I think it's a major problem. There's a, another question um and this is why do some mil millionaires support you and others oppose you and what makes some wealthy people switch sides some are smarter than others <laughs> that's some, some have a clear grasp on um on their enlightened self-interest and others don't um you know i mean there was an article in the new yorker a while back about millionaires spending you know tons and tons of money building themselves bunkers and getting private islands somewhere like as though they're going to be able to outrun outrun angry masses of people there was an article that a great um guy named nick hanauer wrote called plutocrats beware the pitchforks are coming for us and um and the only the only kind of pushback on that piece that we have is it's probably not going to be pitchforks given that there are more guns in this country than there are people i mean we really believe that it is in the enlightened self-interest of the wealthy people in this country to um to take some reforms on the chin and just keep on moving and we have a couple hundred members there are five hundred thousand people in the country who make more than a million dollars a year so we have a lot of recruiting to do i think I think it's two things. I think number one, most rich people don't want to pay taxes anymore than most average people don't want to pay taxes. And since they have this whole system built in to um, wrap themselves in cotton and not be exposed to the angry masses, particularly, um, they sort of just live in complacency and you know never underestimate the power of inertia. 
a body at rest tends to stay at rest. And, um, and, and th this class of people has been very substantially advantaged for a very long time. And it is in human nature to want to protect your advantages. And so I think what our members have in common is, um, is kind of the philosophy that Morris brings to it. Morris insists that he's not any more altruistic than the next person. He's just greedy for a different kind of country. And, um, and we have to build the kind of country we want and it requires unrigging our economy. If, if we are going to address the growing level of inequality and the fact that that inequality is growing more quickly every day, we by definition have built into that mechanism at the heart of our shared experience, our demise. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how to say it more clearly. Uh, I had kind of an ancillary question on the idea of uh, philanthropy versus paying taxes or a combination of the two, because um, philanthropy in, for instance, building a building or a hospital in some country in Africa or anywhere where there are poor people who need a hospital. I, I wonder how many would actually look at the very practical reason of why people would need a hospital over a good water and sewer system. Is it that rich people don't want their names on a sewer system? I think it would do a lot better and it would prevent the need for building that hospital if they had good work. Has anybody considered that type of philanthropy? Well, I, mean, I mean, we need the taxes here, but in the question of rich people giving money for buildings, I mean. Well, that's part of why we need a tax system. Yes. We can't have a system where rich people decide how society's resources should be allocated. Yeah. You know, it's relatively easy to raise tens of millions of dollars to build a new concert hall at Lincoln Center, but no one wants their name on the sewage treatment plant at 143rd Street. Yeah. And we need that too. That's why we need, I mean, I'm all for philanthropy. I think philanthropy is yeah. great. So I, I have some philanthropic efforts, including you know, helping to pay for Erica's staff of two dozen people. Yeah. But we also need most decisions made through the democratic process of voters deciding or through their elected representatives deciding how resources should be deployed. So no, philanthropy is good, but it in no way, shape or form replaces taxes. Yeah, I mean, there was, I read an article on, on well, what, but we give all this money and that's not the point, as you say. So well, I think it's good, but it doesn't solve the struggle. I mean, you know, it's also important to send a birthday card to your mother on her birthday every right. year, but that doesn't replace taxes either. Um, right. I guess a couple of other things I would say is that, um, that as far as philanthropy goes, there's a lot of scheming and nonsense in the tax code that is around philanthropy. So if you're a wealthy person and you put money into a donor advised fund, what's called a DAF, you can um, take the tax deduction for putting the money in there and have absolutely no obligation to ever put it out of there. So you get the tax deduction for doing your good work without ever having it to actually do the good work. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, um, foundations only have a 5% payout requirement per year. We have been working kind of on the side on a piece of legislation that in the wake of the COVID crisis, would require corporations to pay out 10%, foundations of a certain size to pay out 10% for three years and then let that level go back to 5% with the understanding that we are in the middle of a profound crisis post COVID in this country and there are people struggling who really need help. So wouldn't it be great to just kind of gin up, juice up the philanthropic sector to make that happen. Well, going from a 5% to a 10% payout for three years does not seem particularly onerous to me, but the philanthropy round table, which is, um, you know, as the name would suggest, a very sizable industry group for foundations and philanthropists, they have actually hired a lawyer to lobby against this additional 10% payout for three years why? I mean, I don't know why. I think I think that's insane. And so they're clearly like their their focus is clearly not on using the philanthropic dollars to actually do help. 
they're 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 more committed to maintaining the philanthropic dollars than they are to putting them to use. And again, these are folks who have already gotten a tax deduction for the money they put in. So I just reject the notion whole hog. Another point I would make is that there's an article in the New Yorker from several years ago called um, Patriotic Philanthropist or something like that, Patriotic Philanthropy. And it's all about David Rubenstein, who is the founder of the Carlisle Group, and that he does all of this, you know, buys the Magna Carta and like fix the Empire State Building and things like that. And they go to him, I'd like to have enough tax dollars that we can, um, it was the Washington Monument. I would like to have enough tax dollars that we can fix the Washington Monument on our own without having to, to rely on someone like David Rubenstein to do it. He's also one of the biggest defenders of the carried interest loophole, which is one of the most preposterous loopholes in the tax code. It's a tax code that allows investment professionals who have none of their own capital at risk to pretend that they are partners and get the preferential capital gains tax treatment. In this article, um, this article largely credits David Rubenstein with being one of the primary um, drivers of the maintenance of that ridiculous tax loophole. So while he is, you know, repairing the Washington Monument, which we ought to have enough money to do on our own, he is simultaneously undermining everything that Washington agreed with by creating this special carve out for about 5,000 people. And I would just say on a side note that when they took him up to the top of the Washington Monument to thank him for his very generous gift, he carved his name, he carved his initials on the top of the Washington Monument. That tells me all that I need to know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a vandal in addition. Um, Trudy, we have one question. I know we're getting close on time, yeah. but I want to make sure because the le legislative process can be quite confusing, by the way. So Gina has asked, when I call my senators to promote your proposal to tax the rich, what bill or bills am I asking them to champion? So we're in this place now, Gina, where there are all of these standalone bills that have been moving at different stages through the Senate. Elizabeth Warren has a, you know, like basically all of them have a bill. Wyden has mark to market. There's wealth tax bills proposals. There's a um, no more tax breaks for outsourcing bill. All of these bills will kind of get squat. All of the ideas within this bill will get kind of squashed into a big melting pot of ideas out of which Ron Wyden, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, along with his colleagues on the Democratic side, will put together a tax reform proposal. So I think the best thing to do now, Gina, is to call your senators and just demand that they focus on taxing the rich. That is a sufficient message for them at this point. If you want to be specific, my preference would be for people to really lean in on the equalization of ordinary income and capital gains. I think that is an essential driver and it's a piece where we're going to be spending a tremendous amount of attention. Um, so the equalization of ordinary income and capital gains and the other piece I would say is the elimination of the stepped up in basis. So focus on those two, because it's going to end up in a big mush. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a, another question uh, from an anonymous attendee. How do we get the information out to those people who support politicians who play on the despair by blaming their misery on the others? Uh, and so these unhappy people never understand the impact of the rich on their lives. Um, so look, I mean, I'm from North Carolina, all right? I know a lot of Trump-loving folks. Um, and my dream is to take our Tax the Rich Roadshow into every red district in the country. I really do not believe that people understand the degree to which they are getting just constantly screwed in the tax code. And I just have to believe that if this information were presented to them, that it would at least open up some questions in their minds um, I will say that the best thing that politicians can do, though, is, you know, manipulate the population and, and keep them away from focusing on facts. And facts are less compelling than emotional narratives. And so we're trying to do our part between writing a book that has, we couldn't have written a more accessible book, y'all. It's funny. It has cartoons throughout it, but it manages to also be very substantive. So we're working really hard to increase the number of people who just have a basic understanding of some of this stuff. But if y'all know anybody who wants us to come host a Tax the Rich Roadshow, um, 
we'd love to do it. So we have this, you know, we would basically just do the second chunk without all the context setting, but the part that did Morris and I, we would love to present to community groups. We'd love to present um, and do anything we can because I think this anonymous attendee is right. We've got to, we've got to help people understand how the economy is structured and that is not actually the fault of people who look different or act different um, than them. It is actually the money people have screwed you. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of education that has to be done at the grassroots level um, to get the votes out and to have people understand what the real story is. And uh, they've never been given facts. They're just driven by ranting, raving politicians who, who dwell on their emotional status. Um, there's another couple of series of questions. I, I don't know if you can <clears throat> see the chat and the Q&A, but there was a question about uh, other countries and in the chats, it sort of came through with Germany and Australia, but there had been a previous question on um, another, uh, what, uh, does any other country have this disparity between the rich and the avoidance of taxes and the miserable situation of the general public? And what came to my mind was uh, Greece. Um, because the Greece upper class, or I don't know, is I guess Greece is a democracy or is it a monarchy? I can't even remember at this it's point. A I've, I've actually spent a lot of time in Greece working oh, okay. with central banks and the government there. I mean, their problem, I mean, they do have some serious problems in Greece. Much of their economy is people who only work half the year during the tourist season. Um, but they went through this whole process of essentially trying to cut spending to get their way out of the a deficit, which just doesn't work because they cut revenue more than they cut spending. Um, you know, they basically uh, they basically merged the banks with the central government, which they thought would help the government. Ended up bankrupting the banks and the government. Um, so they've had a number of problems in Greece, um, but and, they're, and they do have problems with enforcing the tax laws. They already have. I've, I've worked with bankers who routinely had clients who said, well, he, this is his tax, this is what he declares on his tax forms, but he actually makes this additional amount of income that we based a loan on. So they do have some serious problems in Greece just enforcing the laws, which they already have. Um, so I don't really think that the, I don't really think the situation is that comparable between Greece and the United States. At a macro level, of course, the United States issues a currency. Greece does not have a central bank with monetary policy because they're in the euro, which is controlled by the European Union. Um, so I really think Greece is a whole different issue altogether. But in, in the chat, on another side, on the other one is, is what are the successful rich countries uh, doing? And there's a, uh, Australia, Germany um, are mentioned here. Well, many countries have much greater inheritance taxes, yeah. which essentially have gotten rid of this idea of, you know, having the very wealthy continue to be wealthy for generations upon generations. Um, so I think that's a big difference between our country and other countries. Other countries have much greater amount of progressive taxes. Tax rates in most Western European countries are both lower for the lowest income and higher for the highest income than we have here in the United States as our income taxes. Um, so I think we can actually learn quite a bit from some of the other Western democracies. Yeah, I, I think that that's great. I mean, we have, it's, it's two o'clock and we're kind of, they're going to cut us off. So I, I want to thank you very much for a very enlightening and uh, animated discussion of many issues. Um, I hope I got to most of the questions or summarized uh, the, the sets of questions. And I really appreciate all your uh, attention and your, your discussion. And hopefully we will continue with even more work on the process of reforming our tax code. Thank, Thank you so much. much. This was great. The most fun session we've had. Yeah, this was Thank great, you. Trudy. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of y'all. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all the participants. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.